G'day folks and welcome back to the channel. We are a day late and a dollar short, but it is finally time to start making a new series. This one is going to be a Primal Strike Shaman. And I say Shaman because there's a lot of options for Primal Strike. You can play literally any class as your second mastery, and you will be able to play Primal Strike as your main attack. Uh, but there are a few caveats. So if we just jump over to this little spreadsheet I've made, um, I've kind of made this in the style of a tier list, uh, but it's very one dimensional because if you look right here, this is specifically looking at lightning primal strike. And I'm kind of not interested in range builds. So even though the Vindicator is actually really good as ranged primal strike lightning based um, or aether based. Uh, I'm going to put it in the D tier down here because it's just kind of OK for melee. Now, the top option here is is obviously the Elementalist. There's nothing else that even comes close to how good this is for an overall build in the current meta. So Elementalist is S tier. It easily has the most regeneration available to the class because both masteries have buffs that increase regeneration um, and both of them have a, a kind of a, a good focus on regeneration. You get double class resist re reduction, um, which is from the Wind Devils and the Thermite Mine. You have the best circuit breaker in the game, or at least the best one that's available from the various masteries, this being the uh, Blast Shield. And you have Vindictive Flame, which is just kind of a generic do everything, mess the monsters up, do damage, leech life back, stun them, knock them down, reduce the damage they do. This is just a really, really, really good passive skill to have. And it comes on a very nice base. The cons, of course, to the Elementalist, because no build is perfect, uh, the Elementalist has only kind of okay armor. And this is true for all of these builds. They're all kind of only all right for their armor, unless you are looking at the Warden, which is down here in the, uh, the F tier, which I'll cover when I get to it. Wind Devils, uh, this is a con for every single Power Strike or Primal Strike build that you can make, uh, at least the Lightning ones, because Wind Devils, they suck. They are just awful. Uh, you have to push that button every, what, four seconds if you want all of them out, or if you just want one for the resist reduction, it's every, like, 18 seconds or something like that. Um, I don't like Blood of Dreg and, and Shadow Dance and all those kind of things for the same reason. I just don't want to push the button every 15 to 20 seconds just for it to do anything. Um, so that's a downside for me. Um, other people, maybe you don't care. Maybe you've got a way to automate it. However, um, Thermite Mine is another button. Um, these, both of these I've listed as cons because they're, they're another button you have to be pushing. And then this one doesn't really matter. A lot of class or a lot of builds don't have a movement skill from their class. This is a minor con, but it is a con, so I've left it there. Uh, next best, in my opinion, is the Druid. Um, I'm put him in at A tier. Good regen because it's still a Shaman. Um, all of these builds are going to have good regen because Mugdrogan's packed and all that sort of stuff. Um, Maven Sphere is really nice. Reducing all incoming damage by a percentage is quite good. The Druid has a very high focus on crit damage. It also has the only... Uh, percent increasing spirit skill in any of the masteries so you get more damage from that as well and obviously the mirror is OP although it's very short duration um, it is a very very good button the cons for the druid is that Arcanist doesn't have any resist reduction so if you're playing a druid you're relying on this massive increase of damage from crits to make up for the fact that you are going to have less resist reduction now, a lot of people consider this to be a massive no-no, especially a lot of the, and I'm doing air quotes here, top builders, um, consider this to be a fatal flaw and they won't even look at the build or they'll, you know, they'll have a massive asterisk next to the build. Um, I don't consider this to be too big of a con. However, it is there. It does exist. And, uh, and I did want to put it here. Wind Devils again, because Wind Devils, um, no class circuit breakers, so neither Shaman nor Arcanist has a circuit breaker, unless you're considering Mirror to be a circuit breaker. 
which I don't because you have to push the button. Um, or you could be considering, um, what is it called? Arcane something. One of the passives on the bottom for, uh, for Arcanist triggers at a percent of health and gives you a bit of defensive ability. I also don't consider that a circuit breaker. Um, it's more like a circuit resistor, maybe. Um, so yeah, no class circuit breakers, no class movement skills, same as before. And again, the armor is just kind of okay. You're going to have similar levels of armor on most of these builds. Next up, I would say, is the Archon. And the Archon is only above the Conjurer because the Guardians are passive. You don't have to push a button for these. They follow you around. They shred resistances. They do a bit of damage. Um, they, they are, in my opinion, better than um, Curse of having another button, which I put down here. So B tier for the Archon. Uh, double class resist reduction ascension is really good with the um, the damage absorption, flat damage absorption, really good. And guardians are passive. For the cons, again, we've got wind devils, we've got no class circuit breakers. Notably absent from the cons on the Archon is no movement skill. You will have a class-based movement skill, you will have a uh, an augment movement skill, and you'll have evade. So lots of movement on the Archon. But uh, I'm leaving it down here in B tier, because honestly, Oathkeeper doesn't have a huge amount of uh, lightning support. It's mostly elemental in the form of the Guardians, and then not much else, just your generic buffs like Ascension and um, uh, whatever the buff at the bottom is called. I can't remember at the moment. Okay, Conjurer. I put in C tier. Honestly, I had this in B tier for a while, um, but I think the, the Guardians being passive is just enough that I would put Archon just a tiny bit above Conjurer. Um, but you could consider Conjurer to be B tier as well. It's quite good. You've got the double class resist reduction. Um, you've got Blood of Dreeg, which is really good, although I think it's getting a little bit of a nerf in the next patch, but that's still in testing, so, you know, that could change. Um, but th this one for me, this is a big one. Uh, curse of having another button you have to maintain, and you have to click this for every single enemy you want to apply it to. It's not just, like, Wind Devils are annoying. You have to push them every so many seconds. But you push them once, and then they work on everything for the next however many seconds. Curse of Frailty, you have to cast this on everything. If you want this to work one screen away from where you cast it two seconds ago, guess what you're doing? You're pushing that button again. No class circuit breakers, no class movement skill. Um, I consider the Conjurer to be kind of the bottom of the I would be okay playing this kind of list. So that's why it's in C tier. Vindicator is in D tier. Um, and I feel like I need to justify this because Vindicator is actually really, really good for ranged. But I probably wouldn't use it for melee. It does have some good things for melee. So let's go over this for, for a melee build for Vindicator. Um, you do get Inquisitor's Seal, which I've also listed as a con, because yes, the absorption is really good. Um, the defensive side of Inquisitor's Seal is really good. Enemies take damage from the seal if they're in melee range with you. You take less damage, really good stuff. But if you're moving around because you're a melee build, every time you stop to hit something, you either have to put a new seal down, which might be on cooldown, or you have to um, go without. So if you're able to just plant your feet because you're a ranged build, then Inquisitor's Seal is quite good. If you're trying to move around a lot because you're a melee build and maybe there's a pack of archers over there you have to go get, and then you finish killing them and there's a priest around the corner so you have to go get him. And If you're moving around a lot, Inquisitor's Seal is not very good. Um, double class resist reduction is, again, a pro, but it's also a con because it's on a, a um, an exclusive skill at the end of the Inquisitor tree, which means you don't get Stormcaller's Pact as a Vindicator. So this is a big chunk of lightning damage that you're not going to be able to access, because Aura of Conviction honestly is better, but it's not that much better. So um, Double Class RR is an advantage, but it's also a disadvantage. And then you do have the Horn of Gandalf for percent reduced incoming damage, um, and I think it does Confusion as well. I've got Confusion there. Um, for ranged, though, for ranged, Vindicator is probably at least A tier. Um, all of the problems with Inquisitor's Seal goes away if you can stand still. Um, double class RR, I mean, Aura of Conviction, 
is melee range, so if, if things get close, now they're taking more damage. It's still kind of not great that you can't have Stormcaller's Pact as well, but eh, it's kind of okay. Then we get on to the F tier. And I want to state, before I get into this, that none of these are actually bad. They are bad specifically for melee and lightning primal strike. So Ritualist here, really good for vitality or aether conversions. Um, otherwise, not so good. Um, there's no lightning support at all from the Necromancer. Your pets are useless. Um, basically nothing in Ritualist is any good at all for a lightning build. Similar deal for Trickster. There is a little bit of support in that you can use Shadow Dance as a decent defensive kind of thing. Phantasmal Armor is really good. Um, you could make it a dual wielding lightning build and have the um, the first node on the uh, the WPS line at the top. Gives you a decent chunk of physical resistance and also means that you can dual wield without requiring an item to give you that. The downside, of course, is that dual wielding is going to break the Altos set. Um, and also, there's a really good metal available that the Elementalist uses, the Druid uses. Any of these lightning-based Primal Strikes is going to be using that metal that gives them the ability to dual wield anyway. So you're actually not giving up anything by just not having Nightblade. Um, so I would say for the Trickster, you want cold or maybe bleeding, something to do with bleeding. Um, I'm not sure if you can do bleeding conversion on Primal Strike, but it does have some bleeding on it. So cold conversion, otherwise it's, it's F tier. It's really not very good. And then the Warden. Um, the Warden offers good tank and is otherwise just straight up worse than other options. I would say if you're going to do a physical conversion, then Warden would be something to, con to consider. Otherwise, there is no good reason to be putting a Soldier on this build. You can already get ridiculously tanky without it. And, um, and it only really has a minor amount of resist reduction available. Um, Soldier is just kind of bad for this build. Uh, without conversion, that is. If you want to do physical conversion, I've got uh, different conversions up here. Warden is, uh, sorry, Warder is actually uh, second on the list here of, of things that I would be looking at for a physical conversion, um, whether that's ranged or melee. But, um, but for melee lightning primal strike, it's not good. Um, let's take a look at some of those conversions actually. So via the conduits, you have 100% conversion of aether and cold available. Um, so you don't actually have to use the conduits for these. There is enough other gear that can allow you to do, uh, I think cold caps out at 90% um, global lightning to cold conversion. Um, and I think the aether is something similar. Aether might actually be 100%. Um, I should have wrote this down, but uh, I didn't. So for aether conversion, you're looking at Druid, Vindicator, and Ritualist as being good options. For cold, you're looking at Trickster probably being maybe the best, but Elementalist is also still really, really good. And Conjurer is there as well. Um, same with Vitality. Vitality is where the Ritualist and the Archon are going to start shining. Um, Conjurer is also still good as, as Vitality. It has a lot of Vitality support. Um, and Curse of Frailty is just good for pretty much everything. Uh, for physical conversion, you've got the ranged physical conversion Vindicator. You've got water. Um, if you're doing physical damage, water is actually pretty good because the soldier's uh, physical resistance shredding is very, very good. And his passives are also pretty good for tanking. And then Archon, obviously, is, uh, is pretty good as well. There is a Chaos Conversion build available for the Lightning Primal Strike, and you would want to be using Conjurer for that. Um, there's items that add uh, Chaos Resistance Shredding onto Curse of Frailty, so Conjurer would be my choice for Chaos Conversion, and then there's also Fire Conversion as well. So if for some reason you wanted to play Fire Primal Strike, um, you could do this with Elementalist, Archon, Conjurer, you could probably do it with Druid as well and use uh, the shredding on Electra's Flash Freeze, but that's kind of, kind of not great. 
So, um, you can do pretty much whatever you like with Primal Strike. It's probably the most versatile skill I've actually looked into so far. Uh, but we're going to do Elementalist, and I'm maybe going to make one or uh, or perhaps two of these in the background. Um, not doing a leveling series, but uh, there might be some builds at the end, perhaps. Uh, with that said, let's get back into the game now that I've done waffling for a quarter of an hour. Jeez. All right, and let's create our character. Now, uh, I'm going to go with female this time, and we're going to call her Sparky. And I'm playing on Veteran. This is a personal choice. Um, I personally find normal difficulty to be incredibly boring, and uh, I struggle to stay awake while I'm playing on it. If you're just playing this after you get home from work, you want to have a beer in one hand, you don't want to stress out, you don't want to just, you know, have any kind of challenge or anything like that, just want to relax, play on normal difficulty, okay? No one's going to judge you, no one's going to know, and no one should care. So, personal choice, do whatever you prefer. Um, I'm also going to play on Hardcore, because I enjoy the Hardcore playstyle. Um, this does mean that I will be making some decisions that maybe you wouldn't care about so much in Softcore. I'll be avoiding some areas, perhaps, that sort of thing. Um, I feel the need to mention that Hardcore here, do note that little pop-up there, death is permanent. If you decide to play Hardcore, if you're going to play along, which I strongly encourage, but even if you're not, if you're just going to do your own thing. Um, if you die on Hardcore, your character becomes a ghost. You can't play it. You can't access its stash. All of its items are gone. So um, I've had a few comments on previous video series where people have been playing along and died, and now their character's gone, and they're wondering what's happening. It's this. So if you don't want to lose your character when it dies, turn that off and, um, and just play along. Uh, right, let's get underway. Now, this is a fresh start, so I'm on a fresh account with no shared items, no blueprints from previous characters, nothing like that. Um, this is going to be as if it was your first character, so I already know this is fresh start viable. Um, I'm just going to be doing it. With regards to spinning the camera like that, uh, it is something you can do. It's not something I enjoy doing, so I will be keeping that to a minimum. And before we run across the bridge here, there's a couple of UI things I like to go through. First one down here, the compass map toggle. I like that to be bigger. Um, I'm going to go and actually fight these guys because uh, they're made out of XP and the guards are going to kill them if I don't. So we'll get these down. There we go, I didn't get the soldier unfortunately. But uh, nope, didn't get that one either. Okay. That's fine. Uh, back to the UI stuff. Uh, you have here your Tonic of Mending and your Elixir of Spirit. This is health and energy. I have these on hotkeys, so I have Q and E. I believe by default they're 9 and 0. You can put these back on the hotbar if you want. Um, same with the Evade skill. You can put this on the hotbar. Um, I have mine bound to mouse 4. Uh, so up to you where you want to put those. I personally don't like having them on the hotbar. And then in the options menu, if we come over to key bindings, where are we? That one there. There's a couple here I want to point out. Um, e and Q here, this is where I put my uh, potions. Um, personal rift gates on L, that's all standard. Interact here is U. So if you're standing next to, for example, a treasure trove and you're trying to open it, but there's enemies all around you, you can't click on it. Uh, you can press U instead and it will activate the chest or if you happen to be standing on top of a portal you're trying to get through, like maybe you want to go into one of the Chthonic Rifts, and there's a whole bunch of cultists standing on top of it, and you can't click on it. If you just get next to it and press U, it'll take you in. Uh, pick up here. If you stand on top of an item, or maybe a pile of items, and just push R, um, it'll pick things up for you that you're standing next to. Saves you a whole bunch of clicking when you don't have to click on every single item. Um, it's, it's really good. The other one here is the Evade, which you can put on mouse 4. And then here I have on Z or Z, depending on where you are in the world, uh, Toggle Hide All Items. This just turns your loot filter... Um, sorry, it doesn't turn your loot filter on or off. It turns your ability to see all items on or off. So 
really good for later on when you're doing treasure troves, when you're popping a whole bunch of chests or anything that spits out a lot of loot, but you're also still fighting things. Maybe you don't want to be seeing all the loot on the floor because you're trying to dodge all of the fire on the floor. And so having the ability to turn that off is really good. Um, other than that, let's, uh, let's get underway here. Now, at the other end of the bridge here, we've got our rotting corpse, which will give us our first first yellow item. There's supposed to be a magic item in there. Anyway, I guess I'll use that. Um, and at this point, I'm going to turn common items off. I don't have items in a lot of these slots. I mean, you're ne never going to get a white item here or here, but um, if you want to leave that on for yourself until you get a white or better item in every slot, that's fine. I personally just turn it off um, so I don't have to worry about it later. And then towards the end of Act 1 I'll also be turning the, the yellow items, the magic items off as well. For now I'm going to keep this because we will be doing a lot of crafting at the end of Act 1 and having uh, yellow items to sell means you'll actually have a decent number of bits to buy stuff. Okay. First class, we are doing Shaman straight out of the gate, and unfortunately, until we get to level 3, we will not have access to Primal Strike. Um, good thing is, being level 3, it's it's fine, it's nothing. We're also going to be pumping Physique at the start here. We'll probably take at least 50 points in Physique. Um, maybe we'll do like 5 in Spirit, kind of early-ish just to uh, make sure we have requirements for any kind of jewelry we want to use. Um, unfortunately, this rock here is in the way, so I'll have to go around. Um, we, we want the house that's just on the other side of that blocked road, um, because there is the first weapon for this build in that particular building. It's always there, you're guaranteed to get it, and there's no reason not to get it. So we'll go grab that. So let's just walk in here. And I've got a charged Hevel's Greatsword. Yours might not be charged. Yours might not be anything, but it could be uh, a couple of other things as well. Don't stress about it. Just just pick it up. It's a really good sword. Even even if you happen to somehow manage to get vitality damage or something on it. Um, I don't think it can spawn with that, but even if it did, it's still really good. So we'll just use that. So this particular sword... Base damage at the top there, you'll see it's 9 to 42 lightning damage. That means, unlike this mace, which does physical damage, this sword actually does zero physical damage. It's all lightning, all day, every day, lightning damage. Which, for this build, is really good. The downside, of course, being uh, it's locked at level 1 until you get to Elite, where it's locked at level 60, until you get to Ultimate, where it's locked at, I think, 75. Something like that, it might be 50. Um, but this will be the only time we actually use this weapon, because we will have a different weapon by the time we get to Elite, and uh, we'll have a different weapon also when we do Ultimate. Um, having said that, I probably won't even really touch much of Elite. Um, we'll see. I might go in there for the Fetten Mask or something like that, but probably I'll end up skipping Elite. We shall see. Okay, um... Let's go ahead and grab our main attack here. I'm going to put it on my left click. You can put it on your right click if you prefer. Wherever you prefer it is fine. Just just make sure it's, you know, usable. And when you first get it, it's going to have a cooldown on it. You'll see the second line under current level 1. 3 second skill recharge. We'll be removing that with Thunder Strike later. But for now, you will get just normal swings in between... The, uh, the zappy swings, which just allows you to hold the attack button down. It's pretty much what I do. Just hold the left button. When I'm not hovering over something, it means move. When I am hovering over something, it means uh, use primal strike. And when primal strike's on cooldown, it just auto attacks with the actual weapon. So this is going to be one of the prettier builds that are out there. I'm not sure why, I had a feeling you could bash that boat and it would break. Apparently I was wrong. So we'll grab Faldus here, and if you put your mouse just at the bottom of the option there and spam click, um, he'll go back to town. 
I do recommend if you're playing this game for the first time, um, definitely talk to the NPCs, see what they have to say. Go through, find as many lore notes as you can. Um, it really does improve the game because a lot of the atmosphere, a lot of the world building is contained in those lore notes and uh, talking to the other NPCs. It's, it's very much a grim world. Uh, right, let's let's have a chat about Primal Strike and leveling up, because there's a couple different ways you can do it. The first way, and the way that I'm going to be doing it, is one point in the bar and two points in the skill of some sort. The other way you can do it, two points in the bar, one point in Primal Strike, Rush Torrent, stop this at like level four, Rush Torrent, max that out, then Rush Storm Surge, max that out. The reason you do this is that Primal Strike actually, um, it has a very high energy cost, especially once you can spam it. If you're spending 22, and this gets a lot higher than 22, but if you're spending 22 energy every second, you're going to run out quite quickly. Um, I'm going to put more points into it because I'm playing veteran. Uh, the extra damage is good for not basically turning a, a random zombie into a bullet sponge. Um, and I want to be able to take them out quickly. Because the main use for stats early on is getting health. And you don't need health if everything's dead because you blew it to pieces with your overpowered attack skill. Also, energy potions are a thing. They're infinite and free. The only restriction being the 25 second cooldown. Alright, do remember to get the Aether Crystals if you are playing along. Because there is no such thing as enough Aether Crystals. You will run out as soon as you start crafting anything beyond very basic crafting. And our goal before we go in to fight Kaizog is pretty much to get to level 5. Now if you don't quite get there, it's fine. It's not the end of the world. But that's the goal. So we'll be going in, we'll be fighting Kaizog, and we'll be starting our devotions. I'll talk about devotions when we get our first point, because just like with most things, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. Um, two ways that I consider to be kind of good, and the rest I'm just kind of not going to talk about. <laughs> Alright, so let's get rid of all these zombies. You can kind of round them up while you're doing cooldown Primal Strike and blast them in big, big packs. See if these guys are going to come out of the floor. They may have already come out. Okay. Work our way through these, and then we'll do level 5. There we go. So I'm going to do one point in the bar, two points in Primal Strike. There's actually a lot of uh, different ways you can level up as a Primal Strike Shaman, because we do like Brute Force here. We do want to get the Wind Devils at some point, as much as I complain about having to Pass the skill every four and a half seconds. You don't technically have to do that, um, but this uh, minus elemental resistance here is really good, and we do want to get that. This is also uh, one of the skills we're going to be using for proccing our devotions, so we do want to get this. Uh, Mog Dragon's packed here, really, really good. You get flat health regeneration on this. You also get some energy regen, which is nice, and that physical damage, uh, at least some of it, will be converted to lightning as well. So the, the entire Mugdragon's line is really good for any kind of Primal Strike build. Um, and I'm, I'm probably going to call it Power Strike a lot of times in this series. Um, just know that if you hear the words Power Strike, I'm talking about Primal Strike. I'm just... I played a lot of Diablo 2, alright? <laughs> Power Strike is uh, is much more natural for me to say. All right, when you come in here and you're fighting Kaizog, this guy right here, this rotting soldier, is your first uh, sort of primary target. You want to kill him before you even think about attacking Kaizog. And the other thing is these green zombies are going to throw crystals on the floor like this one. They're going to explode. They're going to put green goop on the floor. And the green goop is is not something you want to be standing in. So if you notice your health bar evaporating, it's probably because you're standing in some of that green stuff. Just target the Plague Walkers down first, and you'll be fine. Oh, and there's me, standing in the goop. 
Again, you'll notice your health bar rapidly going away if you're standing in that. And when you kill Kaizog, everything that he summoned should die as well, so these ones are obviously coming out of the ground over here. Take care of those. Okay, picked up a another gun. So what are we up to? A gun, a crossbow. Thought I had a rifle in here somewhere too. Apparently not. All right, all the points in physique, um, and we didn't get any more skill points. Let's go get our first devotion point here. So I put a hurting on everything with the zappies. Here we go. Um, there is a charged ring of attack. That's pretty good for early on. Copper is copper ring base is going to give us some regeneration, and then charge for the lightning damage, and the uh, offensive ability there. Pretty good. Okay, picked up some other stuff we don't need. Let's talk about devotions. Now I said outside that there's two ways you can really do this, and uh, one of them is the way I'm going to do, and the other one is. Uh, what I'm going to call the speedrunning strat, okay? So early devotions are going to be, you know, the Jackal, the Viper, the ones that are close to the crossroads here. And in some of them, you'll have nodes like this one, which will give you total speed. You'll have nodes like this one, which will give you movement speed. You'll have nodes like this one, which is more movement speed. And so the, like the MLG Pro speedrunning strats or whatever, is to get this node in the Jackal, to get this node in the Sailor's Guide, and maybe this one in the Eel, and then go about filling in the rest of your stuff. And the goal here is to get max run speed as fast as you can, to kind of make this a little bit quicker. Now, I spend a lot of time staring at screens like this doing nothing in the game. Um, so, for me, the move speed is not quite as valuable. Um, but... Still quite good. These devotions are very good early. They become less good later, but they're still decent devotions. However, this is a two-handed weapon damage type uh, build. And so I want to get my hands on the Kraken as fast as I can. So all damage, crit damage, fizz res, all damage, run speed, all damage, attack speed, or sorry, health and attack speed, health and more attack speed. This is really good. Uh, this requires a two-handed weapon, or a ranged two-handed weapon, but just some sort of two-handed weapon. And I want to get there as fast as I can. It's going to be red and blue. We've also got the Widow here, which is going to be our lightning resistance reduction devotion. Um, it's kind of not great to use because you put it on an attack, it has a chance to trigger, then it summons a, air quotes again, pet, which is a bomb. And then if whatever you hit to trigger it is not there anymore, it, it won't go off, it won't do anything. But when something walks over it, it explodes and it applies your minus lightning resistance penalty to anything around it. So it's not as good as, for example, the um, Eldritch Fire over here, which just applies spreading dot onto things. And it, this is a better style, but this is what we've got. So we're going with that. And that's also a lot of blue, a bit of green. So, we're going for the fox first. This is going to be specifically for this node here. The bleeding damage, I mean, Primal Strike does have some bleeding damage on it, so it's not completely useless. But realistically, we're here for the attack damage converted to health that happens to give us enough green in order to get the Kraken. So that's where I'm going first. You could also go blue and get the eel first. This is generic defensive stuff, also some movement speed. And this will be my second constellation after the fox. Alright. So, now that that uh, waffling is out of the way, let's go and actually bash some things with this lightning stick. I think uh, next level, or maybe the one after, we'll be making it spammable. Uh, looks like it's going to be in two more levels. And at that point, it's going to be... Lightning for days. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to go one point in the bar, two points here. So we're up to seven. Um, next level, we're going to be going to ten, and we'll be taking Thunderous Strike at that point. 
You will definitely notice once you have Thunderous Strike that the mana usage or the energy usage is going to go up and not by a small amount. Also, really sucks when you whiff that attack twice in a row. There we go. So that's the good thing about the spam version is it doesn't matter if you whiff one attack because the next one's coming right behind it anyway. Um, I will be putting a lodestone also on my weapon. It's just more lightning damage. So really good things to be having more of. Copper band of fortitude, absolutely. Physique, a little bit of life regen. We'll be taking that. Now, Ferris the Rotted here. This is a quest. Um, we'll call him an NPC. A quest monster. Um, you will have a quest later on to kill him and two of his friends. Um, I'm going to actually just beat him down now. What you can do, if you prefer, is you can walk past him so as you trigger him. And he will spawn at level 7, level 8, whatever level he is. And then he will just stay there at level 7 or level 8. And you go on, you run up the road, you go through the sunken passage, you kill off the giant rock golem who's not as scary as he looks. Then you go through the estate, you fight the boss of the act, you come back, you're level 18, you've got much better gear. You walk up to him, you hit him three times and he dies. And then you go turn your quest in. So that is one way you can do it. I'm just going to get him out of the way now. Um, on this build, I would probably say if you're going to skip any of the three zombies, um, skip the lightning one. Um, Alright, so... Next thing to talk about is regen. This is a regen build. Our sustain is going to be coming from lifesteal, but also from regen. And especially early on, regen is way stronger uh, than, than lifesteal. So you want to get a belt with the of mending on it. You want to get a couple of rings with mending on it if you can, and maybe an amulet as well. Though uh, we'll be using an MI for an amulet, a monster infrequent, which I will explain when I get a better one. Although I guess technically the weapon I'm using is a monster infrequent. Alright, we'll do it now. Just let me blow these guys up. So, monster infrequents are a type of item in Grim Dawn, which spawn, or uh, not spawn, drop from a specific individual enemy, like a boss, or from a specific type of enemy. Um, we will be using a monster and frequent weapon, as well as a whole bunch of monster and frequent items for this build. Um, let's just get rid of those. Um, this is a bad example, because, uh, and so is this, because even though they are monster and frequents, they're the same color as a rare item. So if we look at Barog's bloodied arm here, you'll notice that the the item name is kind of a a more kind of yellow green, more like a dirty green maybe. Um, that's the color from the rainbow filter mod that I'm using. Um, that's the color for monster and frequency. Same with Kaizog's skull here, and Kaizog's skull is only going to drop from Kaizog, and it comes with a bunch of. Um, a bunch of bonuses on the item that are part of the item and then you also get the prefix and or suffix if it drops with both so monster and frequents are very powerful items also a lot of them are going to be making uh, some very powerful changes to your skills uh, so for example later on in the game and i'll point it out when we get to it but there will be a metal that will convert all of the damage from primal strike into vitality damage and we'll change the color of this lightning strike it'll be like pink lightning um i'm not going to be doing that with this build we're going to be doing lightning power strike but um any kind of vitality power strike we'll be using that item to convert the damage and also make it pretty and pink so monster and frequency are pretty important in this game and we'll be using several of them all right, level seven. I'm putting two points in the bar just to get Thunderous Strike under control. Uh, we now swing with the Lightning Zap every single attack instead of every three seconds. Um, also, plus one for physique. All right, let me let me show you. So it's a little bit less impressive now because the area that it covers is less, but um, having it available on every attack 
means that if I whiff an attack, it doesn't matter quite so much. So the white mire here is going to be a little rippy. Uh, you can absolutely die here in this fight because these big guys, if I run away, one of these will have this guy here, this guy here, that cloud behind them. They're doing a charge and that attack that they kind of wind up at the end of it, if that connects, it's going to wipe out a huge portion of your health bar. So you want to be careful about those attacks. You also want to be really careful about your health bar here. You can quite easily get surrounded and deleted. So be careful of this fight. This is probably the first really dangerous fight in the game. Um, the other thing to talk about here is these little things, the Slith Necklaces. Now they drop from the blue sneak people, specifically only the blue ones. And uh, we want to get our hands on between three and nine of them. Now, three is the minimum, and nine is the maximum you'll ever need. So up to you if you want to farm all nine of them in normal. I'm just going to get three and turn it in, because uh, when you turn the quest in, you will get one of the better early rings. And I definitely want to get my hands on that. Also, notice my energy bar. It's half empty already. And that is because we are spamming Primal Strike now. And this is why um, a lot of builds recommend you only get sort of one, two, maybe like four points into Primal Strike, and then you rush Torrent. Because I mean, my energy bar is empty, but oh, it's full again. Um, that was an energy potion. So if you're happy to run out mid-fight and have to use an energy potion, do what I'm doing. If you're not happy to do that, then, uh, then maybe you want to stop here around three or four points. And rush for torrent. Either one will work and both methods of leveling do end up with you spending all of the points in the entire tree anyway. It's just a matter of when you get them. So this guy here, Julius the Decayed, this is another one of the zombies that you have to kill for an early quest. You'll notice that he's covered in lightning. That's not me. That's all him. So he's resistant to lightning. Our damage is lightning. Uh, pretty much entirely lightning. There's a little bit of bleeding we do. But um, if you're having trouble with him, this is another good candidate for just just ignore him and come back later. There we go. I've completely run out of energy for the first time. Um, and it kind of just didn't matter. Okay, any second. There it is. Any second now we're going to run out of uh, room for items. Which seems like any second is actually now. Pick that one up. So I'm going to go back to town and sell pretty much everything that I'm not using right now. I always go to that merchant, but we haven't actually rescued him yet. So keep your eye out early on for rings that have of renewal and also belts that have of mending or rings of mending as well. And it's probably worth just doing a quick search in here. And you'll find something like this. 15 health regen. I'm not going to buy this because obviously it's only slightly better than the one I have. And it's 2,000 iron bits. So that's about a third of all of my available money. Same with the rings. Um, 17 health regen on a ring is actually pretty good. Um, and that is quite clearly superior to that copper band of fortitude. However, once I get two more of these, I'm going to be replacing that with a much better ring anyway. And then this one is not hugely better than that charged copper band of attack. It's much better for regeneration, but it's missing some other stuff. So I'm not going to buy this. Um, the other thing you can search for is lightning damage. Um, we only use two-handers for this build. Um, Primal Strike specifically says it requires a two-handed melee or two-handed ranged weapon so you can play this as a ranged build but um other than that and one exception which only comes online at level 100 you are required to use a two-handed weapon for this attack to work at all kasparov here wants uh four of your aether crystals and he will give you a skill point in exchange also apparently i hit level eight and didn't notice so uh, one point in the bar, two points, this is for the level 8, 
And then for the one point from Kasparov, I'm going to put that in Primal Strike as well. And I will probably stop leveling Primal Strike at this point and start heading for Torrent because the energy cost is getting a little bit out of hand. So I just want to get, you know, maybe a little bit more spirit from getting a few more points in the bar. Um, if we do eventually take, or um, I was going to say, if you're doing a, a Druid, um, there are skills available from Arcanist that would be useful at this point, but um, I don't know why I had Arcanist on, on the brain. We'll be taking Demolitionist, and they don't really have any of that sort of stuff. But uh, you can get more energy and more regeneration from better gear, from spending more points in the bar, etc. Alright, so this house here may have Milton in it. Uh, Milton will have a star above his head as well. Uh, he's not home right now, so... We'll have to go check his friend's house across the road. Um, looks like he's also not home here. So we'll go check his other friend's house around the corner here. So Milton is either in this house. This is the Whitemire Rift, so you can run around there. He'll be in this house. In this house where the untouched meal is. Or he'll be, as in my case, he'll be in this house just here. Or I guess he's outside this house. Where uh, he'll he'll always be in one of those three spots, and we want to kill him. Unfortunately, he is a soldier who also happens to be a fire zombie. So once we get him down to about thirty something percent, he will get a nice big heal. There it is, and also regeneration. So I'm waiting on my energy potion now. Tells me I probably shouldn't have quite so many points in. Primal Strike, maybe somewhere around 8 or 9 would have been more doable, I guess, for me. Uh, but you're only going to run out of energy when you're fighting big bosses where you have to kind of stand there and just do nothing but hit the attack button. Anything, you know, you fight a pack here, you move on. While you're moving, you're regenerating. Two or three attacks, you move on, you're regenerating. Okay, um, Milton's Cask here. Now, I've got Aggressive of Attack, which is actually pretty good, because that's a lot of offensive ability. But um, the Milton's Cask, on its own, is going to give you the extra damage to Aether Corruptions and Ethereals. It's going to give you the shield damage blocked, which we don't care about on this build. And it's going to give you the 22% Aether Resistance there. As well as just being a very good helmet for Act 1. Um, this has... Bonuses that are really good against Ethereals, which is something we want. Because Act 1 is full of Ethereals, including the Act boss himself. So from here, we're going to run up the road and we'll find this house. Now, inside this house is a quest that I don't usually get. But since we're here, I'm going to get it. So we go inside the house and there's a little trap door here. And we'll go inside. Now these guys are going to be doing, I think, vitality, but it might be chaos damage. Um, either way, they can be a little dangerous, so just keep your finger on your healing potion and you'll be fine. The other thing you can do, these guys are doing poison, so they're not actually bloodsworn. Not proper bloodsworn. What you can do is just hide around the corner, and then they'll come through the door one or two at a time, or they'll group up by the door and you can just mow them down as they come in. Okay, level 9. Um, I am going to, as I said, stop putting points in Primal Strike at this point. I'm going to put one in Mogdragon's Pact, just for that health regen, a little bit of physical damage, and a little bit of energy regen, which is something that, as I mentioned before, we, uh, we are definitely going to be needing some of. Um, Check these pants. Pretty good for those. Okay, once you've fought your way through the cultist's lair here, you're going to have Isaac here. Now, he's going to give you a quest and then promptly die, although apparently he's not hes not dying. That's fine. hes He says something along the lines of, you know, don't worry about me. I'm already dead. Go and, go and grab my stuff that I hid. Also got uh, some lore notes here. 
Again, make sure you're reading these. They're really good for building the world. Really add to the experience. Okay, um, let's go outside. And I believe I left someone alive at the door here. Yep, there he is. And let's have a close-up of our character. All these leaves floating around us. That's the, uh, that's Mogdrogon's pack here. So we'll be getting some regen from that and also some damage. And then later on we'll be getting a whole bunch of health, some more regeneration, and then over here some armor and resistances. It's a really good line in general. Um, it's just a shame that you kind of need the points for other things while you're leveling. Because, as I say, it's really useful. Okay, coming over here to the... I guess this is the east side of the Sodden Hollow, or the top half of the White Mire. And the reason we're over here is visible in the top right hand side of my screen there. You can see that little star up in the corner. That is my good friend Negan, who is the last of the various different flavored zombies we have to kill. Um, when he puts his ring of fire up like that, it's probably worth it to run away. Um, probably worth it to kill these guys. Especially since I've uh, used my potion and need some healing. So, like I said, when he's got his little ring of fire up like that, you know, he's been to Taco Bell or whatever Mexican happens to be close by to you, he's got his ring of fire going, just walk away. And then you don't stand, don't have to stand in that, but he's quite low, so I'm just going to kill him. This little pile of zombies is actually pretty good XP as well. All right, once again, out of energy, so I am considering taking a couple of points out of this, but I probably won't do it, mostly because I'm lazy, but uh, 10 points should be fine. Get another couple of levels, it's like it's never been a problem. Okay, Vampiric is good. That's uh, that's going to be lifesteal. Uh, what else did we get on that? Vampiric of Corrosion. So... Corrosion is literally worthless for us. We don't do any acid damage, so 7% extra on top of zero is zero. Um, but that lifesteal, 4% attack damage converted to health, and the energy is actually pretty good, so I'm going to swap that in. Um, unfortunately, I'll be losing my 16 physique, which is not an insignificant amount of health. But it is what it is. Okay, so these blue guys have got to go. Um, I said it in other series as well, we are definitely racist against the blue slith around here. And we've got one necklace, so I need one more. As long as we're in the area as well. So we've got the, the foggy bank rift, there's my ring, so I'll go turn that in in a minute. Um, now that I've got all the ones I need, they drop like candy. So here's the foggy bank rift, and here is an entrance to a cave. Inside this cave, we're looking at a Devotion Shrine, you can see it just there on the map, um, as well as a whole bunch of little moving things that are made out of XP, so we can kill those off. There we go. And here's our Devotion Shrine. Now this one is glowing red, and it's going to be called a Desecrated Shrine, instead of whatever the blue ones are called. The blue ones want you to make an offering, give them a crafting item. The um, the red ones are going to try and kill you, so this shrine is corrupted, needs to be cleansed, summon what is trapped within, let's go. Alright, there we go, another slith necklace, just because, you know, we don't need them anymore, so they're everywhere. <laughs> um, steel helm here, probably more armor, yep, more armor, more health, we'll chuck that on. Same of these pants, um, more armor is really good, especially for this uh, this phase of the game, so I'm going to put those on. Um, checking boots for run speed or movement speed, you definitely want to get some of that. Um, you could also have been putting points into spirit, um, if you are doing that I'd probably say 5 points is all you need. Um, and we did hit level 10, so I could take demolitionists at this point, but honestly... 
The things I want from Demolitionist is Vindictive Flame, Ozone's Wrath, Blast Shield, Thermite Mines, and probably Flame Touched, um, and Tempa, most likely, although these will be much more useful later when you can convert them. For now, we're just going to stick with Shaman, and now we have Torrent, which is going to add an extra effect to our Primal Strike. So before, we just had the Lightning Striking from above, now we also have a chain lightning like effect that will bounce from our main target and hit how many? Three other targets. There you go. So probably actually the main target and then bounces twice. Something like that. Um, we are starting on the fox here. So a bunch of stats. This will help with our energy. Um, 15 spirit. We have a look at what spirit actually does. Um, it's going to be giving us energy, it's going to be giving us magical damage, it's going to be giving us energy regen as well, so getting more spirit is definitely good. This is actually, I think, the third time I've done Act 1 on a Primal Strike Shaman, just testing various things, and this is the first time I've had any issues with energy. So what I'm thinking is that the other playthroughs I had, you know, a pair of pants that had 20 energy, or 20 spirit on it or something like that. And that was enough for it to not be an issue. Okay, so from this cave, we're going to head over here to the west. I'm going to take out Finlan and the Vile here. Although, I think we should probably kill his friends first. And by kill his friends first, I mean run away. Well, there's two of them, that's why. Wait, no, there isn't. Just had too many friends. Okay, that's fine. Take out his friends. And then we'll take him out as well. Um, haste is going to be movement speed, also a bunch of extra armor, and armor is definitely something you want to be stacking early on. Um, that's fine. Armor to reduce the damage you take, and regeneration to heal the damage you took. On this little island here, you'll notice the star on the map at the top there. That is Isaac's stash. Now, if you don't know about this quest, finding it is... Maybe not guaranteed, shall we say. Alright, um... First amulet you get, chuck it on. Doesn't matter what it is, it's going to be better than the salt bag you start with. This one here has spirit offensive and energy regeneration, as well as some aether resistance. The fire, aether, and burn damage is completely useless to me, but it's still better than 5% less damage from ethereals, so I'm going to put that on. The other thing to note is Isaac's spaulders here will always spawn in here, and they are a good early rare shoulder pad. This one happens to have spawned with Nature's Bounty, which is plus two to Heart of the Wild. So next level I might put a point in there as well, and then one point in Torrent, and one point in the bar, something like that. Um, only because I have this, but uh, one point in this whole line is good. We will be getting items with plus one to all Shaman skills. Um, I won't say soon, but kind of early in Act, say probably Act 3. Or late in Act 3 or early in Act 1, depending on where you put the split. Okay, let's jump back to the foggy bank here. We're pretty much done here, actually. I forgot about the ring. We're going back to the White Mire. Now, if you don't have three Slith necklaces by now, uh, why not be surprised, but also... Just go and kill some more blue slith um, from the White Mire Rift here, all the way up north. They're everywhere. I uh, would be very surprised if you didn't have enough of them. Usually there's some through this little camp area here. If you head north up here, there's going to be even more of them in this area. I'm very surprised I haven't found any. Here we go, here's some. And like I said, up to you if you want to keep farming them to get nine which is all you will ever need so you need three for normal three for elite three for ultimate um, although for this build you need three for normal and then you're probably done so ignore what i said earlier just get three and then move on because we are going to be using golos rings um right so torven here what might that be? Will these suffice? Thank you very much for my new ring. Slith Primal Ring here. Really good early ring. So we'll go ahead and chuck that on. 
Um, wasn't that one I wanted to get rid of? Yeah, we'll get rid of that one. And as long as we're in the area, we'll check these. Now, rare two-handed weapons early on are a trap. Um, if I had 12,000 bits, I definitely don't want to be spending it on a weapon, especially not one with a pet bonus. Um, but I don't want to be spending it on a weapon just in general. You want to be looking at uh, things like these tarnished moles, level 10-ish weapons. Maybe these axes are probably good as well. Um, this axe, 84 DPS. So the green number there, the plus 84, plus 52, plus 84 damage per second, it's kind of a guide only. Be careful about following it. As soon as your weapon has any kind of cluster skills on it, it has uh, maybe it has attack speed, but you're using spells, um, any of that sort of stuff, just be very careful about that number. It's it's meant to be used as a guide only. Um, this one, however, is considerably better than this. It's got more than three times the base damage, and then you add additional damage on top. And we're going to convert some of that to lightning with the cracked lodestone there. Also note that I kept this weapon because I'm going to be disassembling it later for the lodestone. Um, right. Let's head back to the foggy bank, and we're going to head north now. So in the foggy bank north section, you're looking for a merchant. That little pop-up and noise there was saying something about the caravan looking fresh. And it's because my good friend um, Luther Graves here has been trapped. Now, your Luther Graves may not be here. Uh, if you get to this little bottom corner section and he's not here, then you want to head directly north. Because the second place that he could be is just around the corner. So if we head just up here, the second place he could be is kind of behind this tree, I think. But uh, somewhere around this camp, definitely. And he'll be in that same little wooden prison thing. So if he's not here, and he's not, not down here, not up here, then the last place to check is over this way. Um, I'm going to keep these as well, because I know I said we won't be using the ring from Elite or from Ultimate, but it's still a quest. Quest XP is pretty good, so do keep them. Don't throw them on the floor. Alright, third location for Luther Graves is just up here on the hill, right here, so almost directly above this cave entrance is where you want to be looking. Um, we, however, are not going into that cave. Don't really need to be here at all, actually. Who are you, Jaron? Okay. I'm going to kill your friends first. Hold that thought. I'll be right back. Lightning type, okay. Alright, let's actually get around to his other side. So his friends have to come a little bit closer, and they'll get hit by the zappy zappy. Alright, picked up some rare gloves. Yep, there we go. Now these don't offer as much, but a little bit of resistance, and more importantly some armor in that slot. It's all good things. This helmet is um, actually not so good. We don't do most of that damage, so this is basically offensive ability, some Aether Res, and some Energy Regen. In one more level, we'll be using Milton's Cask anyway, so I'm just going to ignore that. Um, however, we do still have a white chest, so let's go swap that over for sure. Okay, speaking of level 11, uh, what did I say? One point here, one point here, and one point in the bar? That sounds good. So because we've got plus two from our shoulders, we get a level three Heart of the Wild instead of level one. And it's just 18% increased effect of all the health regen we're going to be stacking, as well as a bunch of extra health. And I am still going to take that, but I'm also going to put one point in Brute Force here. This will add uh, some flat lightning damage to all of our attacks, and also 50 health, which is good stuff. All right, we are done here in the Foggy Bank, so let's head on over to 
the next area. So generally speaking, for the various acts in this game, follow the wagon trail and head north, and you'll generally get to where you need to be. Uh, bridge is out here. If you want to, you can spend lots of money repairing it, but um, no, we're not doing that. We're going to go through the flooded passage because XP and also because there's a boss at the end that has a nice amulet that uh, that we're going to be using, probably. You may have found something better by the time you get to him, but um, his amulet is a pretty good starting point early on. Okay, so this guy is going to be an absolute pain to kill, not least of which because he has friends, but because he's defender type, um, let's get rid of these, take as little, little damage as possible. Um, because he's a defender, he's going to make himself and all of his friends tougher to kill. That's right, we got rid of him, and now his friends should go down a little bit quicker. There we go, and what do we get? War sword, some rare pants. What do these pants do? They have a bunch of stats. So of the eagle is really good for adding stats. Tempest is going to be all that elemental stuff and more armor than what I'm wearing. So yes. Also picked up this rare weapon, which as you can see is considerably better than the, is it though? Hang on. So this is where you want to be careful. Uh, this is actually a better weapon because of the 8% attack speed. The Cunning is going to give you more offensive ability, so you hit more often. And the Piercing damage is okay. So this is not amazing, but it is better. So I'm going to use that. And once again, let's put the Lightning Damage Conversion on there. And we'll be on our way. So we're going to be attacking a lot faster now, which is good for damage, but also kind of bad for our energy. So we'll have to see how fast we run out. It's actually not looking too bad. Maybe we can put some more points in Primal Strike now. Alright, so the Flooded Passage, the goal is basically to get to the top right corner. And once you get there, you will find a Devotion Shrine and the boss standing in front of the exit. So that's what we're looking for. Um, let's just go and get rid of those idiots. Things like that, uh, ranged attackers generally do most of the damage in this game, with a few exceptions obviously, but um, yeah, you want to get rid of the little ones before you worry too much about the big scary looking guys. The big scary looking guys do generally do a lot more damage than, for example, one of these little scavengers, but um, if you've got four of these, it's going to take you longer to kill the big one. And it's not going to be doing as much damage as the little pack of, little, of the smaller ones. So a lot of this stuff you could skip as well. Um, it is made out of XP though, and I'm kind of watching my energy. Just to kind of get a gauge, get a feel for how much I'm using. Alright. Here's our Devotion Shrine, let's go ahead and clear the area first, good practice in Hardcore, don't click on anything when you're, uh, when there's other stuff to kill first. There we go, and that's our first blue item drop, um, I will not be using that one, but uh, it is our first blue item, so a one-handed dagger there. And I'm just going to leave that one, leave that one on the floor, pick up the other one. Am I going to use that? Uh, definitely not. Okay, so the Shambler here, he's always here. And you can more or less just stand here and kill him. Uh, he does do a Sundering attack, which he'll probably show off here in a second. You'll see a big orange circle above his head. And I'm going to... I'm going to eat it in the face, just to kind of show it. There we go. And one attack, and the Sunder is gone. So his Sunder you can pretty much ignore. 
because he only does one other attack while it's active, and it doesn't hit very hard. So, Right, the Shambler's Heart here. This is a monster infrequent, and it comes by default with percent increased armor and some elemental resistance. Now, that already is going to be better than whatever it is I'm wearing, but uh, this one also has poison and acid resistance, as well as some total speed. I think total speed comes by default, but it's got some other stuff as well. Considerably better than what I was wearing. So we'll go ahead and use that. One point in the bar, two points in torrent. And my inventory is full. So I'm going to go back to town and sell this. Again, I'm collecting iron bits for Act 1. Because we're going to be spending a lot of them at the end. To do some crafting. Also going to put Milton's hat on. And, and then I'm just going to vendor all the rest of this. There we go. Got any renewals yet? Okay, that's different. How about mending? I still got this one ring here, which probably wouldn't be a horrible idea to, uh, to buy a cheap mending ring, either preferably a gold ring, but copper could be okay. Anyway, they don't have one. Let's check the other merchants. So if we just do a search for mending, it's vampiric, which is lifesteal, copper band, which is one health regenerated per second, and then of mending, which is another 16. This one is 3,000 iron bits. Um, I'm actually going to buy that. I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to. Also, I'm going to put some polished emeralds on these two rings. Um, you could also put one in your helmet if you happen to have a third one. And I'm going to put a scavenge plating on... Uh, yep, on that belt. So, uh, something with this game's armor stats is your helmet gets better armor because you have more armor on your belt. Um, don't question it, just accept it and move on. Uh, it is what it is. So if you notice here, the very top line there, you have a 15% chance to get hit in your head slot, for which I have 108 armor and 70% absorption. What this means is if I get hit for 100 damage and it happens to hit me in the head, because I only have 70% armor absorption, 30 of that damage, or 30% of the damage, goes straight through my armor, and I take that damage regardless. So if I had a million armor, I would still take 30 damage from a 100 damage attack. And then the remaining amount is reduced by a flat amount of whatever my armor rating there is. So if I happen to get hit for 100 damage, I will take 30. Because 30 damage will go through due to my armor absorption, and then uh, uh, 70 will be up against my armor, and my armor absorption is higher than 70, so I take zero from that. If I get hit for 200 damage, 60 damage would go straight through my armor, and then I would have uh, 140 left, so I would take an additional 32 damage from that attack. Um, but armor coming from... So if I had um, a component on my boots that gave plus 10 armor, then my boots would be at 65, but my gloves would be unaffected. Armor coming from sources that are not each of these individual slots, or, or rather each of these six slots, so head, shoulders, chest, arms, legs, or feet, armor coming from sources that are not those individual items applies to all of them. So if you have a look at this belt here, it's got seven armor at the top plus another 15, so a total of 22 armor. If I have a look here, I have 108 armor on my helmet. I take my belt off. Now I have 84 armor on my head. Um, so make sure you have an armor component on your belt. And if you happen to get anything in your devotion tree, like for example, where are we? Plus 40 armor from Solemn Watcher. There's another plus 40 there. There's a few, few of these types of things around. You get that plus 40 armor in every one of these slots. So that's why that one's kind of good. Okay, let's head back into the flooded passage, pick up my remaining loot, and then head out the other side. Okay. So we're coming up on an hour and a half here, and uh, I'm going to end the first episode here, just at this next rift gate. 
So this is halfway through Act 1, and I realize I did a lot of waffling and not a lot of playing in this episode, but hopefully people got something out of it. So uh, this will be the end of this episode. Thank you all very much for watching. See you in the next one, and goodbye for now.